Welcome to Ask Kalefi, the podcast that dives into real-life problems that plumbing and HVAC technicians face in the field. We're your hosts from the Kalefi Tech Support Team. I'm Greg Tubbs. And I'm Dan Furkus. Welcome. We look forward to sharing some stories from our tech calls and using our background and expertise to make your days a little easier. Hey there, welcome back. Uh, another episode of the Ask Leffy podcast. How are you doing, Dan? I'm doing good. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for coming back. Today we got a special guest, one of our education and training managers, Mr. Max Rohr. Max, how are we doing today? Yeah, Max. I'm doing great. Long time, uh, long time listener, first time caller. So excited <laughs> right. to be on the show with you guys. Right. Yeah, we're excited to have you here today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, obviously, you're a pretty smart guy. You're one of our one of our training guys here at Kalefi North America. But give us a little background on on your career in this industry. Sure. Yeah. So I uh, I've been tying radiant uh, pipe to to mesh or rebar uh, since I was like seven or ten years old or something like that <laughs> with right. the family business working with my dad. So I would have my uh, buddies come with me in for probably you know, ten dollars for the day. We'd snip all the the zip ties uh, and pick up all the pieces and get it ready for the concrete pour. So I've been around the uh, radiant pipe for a long time. Then have since worked uh, in the wholesale and rep and uh, PEX manufacturer levels for Rayout most recently for about five years. So kind of seen the the radiant industry from a bunch of different angles and uh, and really love it. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, we're happy to have you here today. We got a big topic today. We're going to talk about PEX. So we're excited to have you here to talk with us about that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, we make a pretty wide range of products that work with different types of PEX. And uh, we a get, lot of different fittings to attach to it. Right. And we get plenty of questions about, you know, will it work with this or will it work with that? And uh, from from the from the product aspect of it, but then we also get plenty of design questions too. So. Uh, we got a few bullet points we're gonna we're gonna tackle with you today. Yeah, we actually do get a lot of questions about application, and you know we don't really design systems, but you know, you myself and Max, we all have a background of you know, installing and and working with Pax and Radiant systems. So you know, we, we help a little bit. We don't we don't design the full system. Yeah. First things that we want to talk about is just you know why use Radiant Heat. Yeah, I love Radiant because it's uh, one of those few things in life that uh, when done well is a great mix of comfort and energy efficiency. So uh, you get both at the same time. Uh, you can hide it in the floors, the ceilings, the walls. Uh, you can use all sorts of different heat sources. So it's kind of future-proof in a sense that you could use a uh, non-condensing boiler with uh, you know, like a boiler protect valve, condensing boiler, air to water heat pump over the course of the life of the system. Um, and in a big picture, it's about 30% energy savings compared to forced air when it's installed well. So I think those are some of my favorite things about, about Radiant as a, a general way to, to heat or even cool a space. Yeah, it's really versatile with the design. I mean, you can you can size your piping and spacing in, in application to work with some pretty low water temperatures, which really gives you quite a gain in efficiency. Yeah, lots of, lots of sur- surface area, lower water temperature is kind of the name of the game. Right. We even hear applications, you know, we always think like radiant floor, but I hear radiant ceiling and walls. I mean, I've seen it put in shower walls. I mean, there's really, it's really a versatile application. Yeah. Corner, corner unit of a multi-story building with radiant. If it's all glass, you know, below the the windows can be a nice way to go. Just that really cold part of a, uh, a building or a house or something like that. You can, you can hide it anywhere. Yeah, that's really nice that you can you basically make it invisible in the home, home or, or office space. Absolutely. Well, I'm in floor heating's been out for a long time. You know, I mean, I've worked on systems, old Frank Lloyd Wright homes that have steel piping in the floor. Oh, steel or copper. Yeah, yeah. And, and my house in particular has uh, copper in the ceiling. So yeah. I, that's been I I abandoned that. I don't even use it because I'm afraid of the sprinkler system that might <laughs> <Right>. occur <laughs> at some point. Will or could? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's uh, so there were a lot of cool systems with metallic pipes. Uh, concrete is not friendly to the metallic option, so that's why a lot of those systems have failed. Then that's why they've uh, switched to PEX because uh, PEX is pretty uh, pretty indifferent to the chemicals in the concrete, so it, it makes for a much longer life span inside of the you know, embedded in concrete. It's, it's very happy. So you guys want me to kind of cover the the difference between the, the PEX uh, variants that are on the market right now? Yeah, I think we should talk about that. I we mean, should. I think maybe people don't understand the different types of PEX that are out there. Sure. So uh, PEX in general, uh, polyethylene cross-linked is what we're talking about, and it's abbreviated to PEX. So if you take like a red Solo cup um, that you'd get at a barbecue or something like that, you can rip it like a piece of paper. You can rip it from you know, where you would take a drink all the way to the base and it rips straight down. It's polyethylene, but it's not cross-linked. So with PEX, you cross-link it, and it ends up more like at the molecular level, like a chain-link fence or a spider web. So you can't really rip uh, PEX in any direction. It doesn't have parallel molecules. They're all kind of woven together. So that makes it strong and flexible. And then uh, as far as the, you know, the standards go, if it's listed to ASTM F876, it's going to work for radiant installations and it's going to have all the performance characteristics that you need for that type of installation. So then it breaks into three different camps. And depending on where you live or what you've installed, you may have a uh, you know, blood rivalry with these different types <laughs> of techs, but I'll just kind of describe the difference between a, B, and C, how they're produced and kind of uh, where you go from there. But again, uh, support is going to be the deciding factor between these different companies and different types of PEX. That's really what you should shop for. Uh, all ASTM F876 listed, pi listed pipes, they're going to hold water. They're going to meet performance standards by an inch or by a mile, but they're going to cover what you need to do for radiant heating. So PEX A or the Ingle uh, or peroxide method. So picture a pasta maker since we're an Italian company. So you've got right. you know a big pile of dough, then you squeeze it through a specific shape. So it's gonna come out like a, you know, like goes from raw ingredients that it blends in the extruder, and it's gonna come out the, uh, like a Play-Doh maker as well, the shape of the, the pipe. So with a PEX A, the polyethylene is actually cross-linked right at the edge of the pasta maker. So right as it's coming out into the initial shape, it's cross-linked right then. So some advantages there is that with the PEX A, you can repair a kink with heat. So if you do bend it during the installation, it always kind of wants to go back to that initial shape, and the PEX A lets you heat it, and it kind of relaxes the kink right out of it. Yeah, the so PEX another thing that you can... I was going to oh, say, right. the PEX A always seems to have quite a memory in the, in the pipe. I've, I've noticed that. I've kinked a PEX A pipe before, and I've used a heat gun to heat it up, and, and it would regain its original shape. Yeah, it wants to come back to that, uh, that kind of origin story shape, the marble origin story round. It wants to get back to that. So um, the other reason that that's important is that you can use it with cold expansion fitting. So the PEX A pipes, you can expand them over the barb of a F1960 um, or a compression sleeve style fitting. You can expand that up and over, and then the, the memory of the pipe brings it back down to seal over the barb. So uh, really flexible, best flexibility of the, the group of A, B, and C, uh, and always wants to come back to that shape. So those are some of the properties that you use to your advantage if you're going to install a, a PEX A. Right. So... Then we'll move to PEX B. So this is called the moisture cure or a thylene method. So after the polyethylene is extruded into the shape of, of the size of whatever pipe you're going to make, then you coil it and you cross-link it in coils in like a steam sauna, basically. So there's no kink repair with this type of, uh, this type of pipe with a B. You're going to want to cut out any sort of kink and put in a fitting or a little coupling there to uh, fix the a kink if you get one uh, but it is a little bit more rigid than an a and that can be you know that could be good because uh, if you're trying to hold a higher pressure i mean anything in a plumbing uh and heating situation you're not getting anywhere near the performance capabilities of these pipes they're all well over qualified for what you do for just a radiant system um but 
uh, maybe a little bit less expensive than an A2 and is still going to be able to uh, install easily to make the bends that you would need for uh, a radiant system. Right. Yeah, then the I've last one with that as well. Yeah, one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, if you're going to install a B, it likes to bend tighter in the direction that it was coiled. So if you take a B and you try and bend it completely, I guess, like against the grain, against the uh, it doesn't like to do that as much. So give it like a little 180 twist and it's going to want to bend a little bit tighter the way that it was coiled. Okay. And then the the last one, the PEX C, so this is also called like the radiation method. So after the polyethylene is extruded, you almost microwave it in a sense. So you put it in coils into like an uh, an oven kind of, and then you're going to facilitate the cross-linking like that. So both a B and a C are going to be after the fact that you're making the cross-linking uh, where the A is right at the ex extruder. So those are kind of, uh, you could get, a full eight hours out of any of your PEX people on why A, B, or C is better. Um, and they're they're all going to work well for, for radiant heat. So again, it's kind of support is where I would lean right, if you're right. trying to decide between one or the other. Yeah, I've, I've in the, in the past, I've always worked more with the PEX A product and, and I like that because I always use the expansion fittings and, you know, if you ever run the risk of kinking it, especially, you know, laying tubing down in the floor and you get a kink, right. you're not subject to have to put a coupling and you can heat that up and get that to go back to its original form. Um, so that, that's what I always liked about the PEX-A. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it makes for an easy day. Um, with the, with the Kalefi components that so we actually have tail pieces with our different products for either expansion for a PEX A uh, for a F1960 type fitting or for a crimp fitting that will work with an A, B, or C. So we've got tail pieces that you can go from any of those to our products, which which makes it helpful. Yeah, that is nice, especially when you get to the manifold, that transition to the manifold. It's not going to matter what type of PEX you have. We have a great fitting to to adapt there. Certainly. Yep. Yep. You could even mix and match if you wanted to. Wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I know one of the, one of the big requirements with a radiant system is you know having that oxygen barrier. Um, yeah, so, the, so that's a big deal, and that's something that came up in the polybutylene days for people that have been doing radiant for a long time is that they had this flexible plastic that made uh, you know, radiant installs easy, uh, but it didn't have an oxygen barrier. And then what people noticed is that you know, months and years later they were just running through uh, ferrous components in the system. So this is going to be your expansion tank, right. the thinnest steel, uh, or a cast iron uh, volute of a pump. They would just get really gummy, and they would, they're basically rusting from the inside out. And it's because oxygen will continue to enter through the pipe, even though it doesn't leak, and then it continues to rust your components. You want kind of a tight drum inside of your radiant system, and until we figured that oxygen barrier out, we, we weren't accounting for that. So now there are rules about it. There's a, a DIN 4726 uh, standard that basically is a global standard that sets the limit for how much oxygen can come through the PEX. And what they do to protect the, the oxygen from coming through is they put like an additional jacket. It's called a co-extrusion right over the PEX that's specifically designed to keep the air from uh, you know, coming through the wall of the text. And that is important because then your other components aren't rusting away. For Kalefi products, it's not really an issue. It's also not an issue for the pipe because we're making stuff out of brass or plastic, or rubber, and then the pipe itself doesn't rust. There's nothing ferrous in the pipe. It just uh, it manifests in your, your other metallic uh, components or your heat exchanger of your boiler, which is definitely not where you want to have uh, big blobs of uh, rusty debris. Right. Yeah. You see that up. a lot with your cast iron pumps or if it's put in with a cast iron boiler. Or hydraulic separators that are hooked. Yeah. To expansion systems. tanks. That, that was one of my first calls when I got here was a contractor had some non O2 barrier packs. He had no idea what he had. Right. But he called Pretty, pretty upset that, you know, hey, this thing, we just put it in not that long ago. It might have been six months beforehand. It's pinhole leaking. What are you going to do for me? Why is it rusting out? Well, 
you know, yeah. one thing leads to another and you're trying to talk to them and you find out that it's some really old PEX that's non-O2 barrier. Right. And, you know, the only thing you can recommend at that point is, hey, you need to put a heat exchanger to separate that part of the system away from the primary. Side yeah, exactly. Right. That's yeah. the that's the best recommendation is just to separate it completely and then you protect the rest of your new expensive components. Yeah. I'd I'd usually see that when you had a homeowner that came in and put their own packs down and they looked at the price of packs and realized that, you know, boy, I'm going to pay X amount for something with an oxygen barrier. And for, you know, a quarter or a third of the cost, I can get this other packs and why can't I just put that in? And sure. Well, then it ends up costing them a lot in the end. Yeah. A lot in service calls and, Replacement parts. Right. Yeah, system repipes to try to separate it. And one of the things I always stress with PEX, too, is that if there's something that you would spend a little bit more on, it should probably be this thing that you bury in concrete. Absolutely. <laughs> you might, yeah. If you wanted right. to save a couple of dollars on an expansion tank uh, or you know even a pump or something like that, you can replace those. Yeah. You might even have isolation valves or whatever. You're not going to want to chip off the concrete and uh, put new pecs in. It's, it's basically going to be the type of system that people abandon. So it's worth spending the money up front to design and install it well. Right. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, PEX is definitely more of a permanent component of the system. Yeah, and when you pick a good quality PEX and installed right, I mean, it's going to be there. It's going to last a long time. It's going to perform well for you. I mean, in most cases, it's going to outlive the house. <laughs> Yeah, it sure is. At least in North America where we change houses so frequently. Right. Yeah, but, you know, 30 30 plus years is is not unrealistic for PEX, especially when it's buried in concrete. Right, right. Yeah, it's a solid product. How would you go about protecting PEX, uh, say, from sun and other damage? So, generally speaking... Uh, the sun hates plastic or plastic hates the sun. I'm not sure <laughs> which one or both. That's a UV. Uh, and maybe, yeah, the UV and a good way to, you know, see this in, in real time is if you, you guys uh, are around fishing boats, if you see a boat that's just been out yeah. in the sun or in the water forever, uh, it, the sun just eats it away and makes the, the plastic brittle and things like that. So, Best case scenario with anything plastic is to keep it out of the sun unless it's specifically designed to be in the sun. Um, so with the oxygen barrier pipe, you want to install that and then pour the concrete over it as soon as you can. Uh, specific PEX manufacturers will give you an answer in a number of days and they'll say, okay, you need to keep this out of the sun. Uh, you can't have it in the sun for more than 90 days or something like that as an example. The reason you wouldn't want to do that anyway is because if you're going to install a radiant system and just leave it uncovered for 100 days, somebody's going to put a nail through that or step on it or drive a truck over it, over a sharp edge, and you're going to have a leak somewhere. So the sooner you can put it down and cover it up with concrete, the better, uh, just so you're not tracking down leaks when it comes time to uh, pour the concrete. But uh, what will happen with the sun is it breaks down the pipe and makes it brittle over time. Um, and that's just not anything that we want. So what you want to do, uh, another thing to protect the pipe is if you're transitioning out of the concrete, so maybe this is right under the manifold or across an expansion joint or something like that, you want to put either a bend guide, like a, a PVC bend guide, uh, or a corrugated sleeving between the expansion joints. So there's not a little friction point with the plastic. So coming out of the slab, there can be a sharp concrete edge. Sure. You want to make sure that as the pipe heats up and cools down, it's not just wearing on a sharp concrete edge. So that's where those bend guides are important sure. uh, to make sure you take away that wear point and then uh, you're setting yourself up for success there. So uh, that's a, a definitely a best practice. Yeah, I always like to try to get in as close to the concrete being poured as possible. Try to get in the day before, knowing the masons were coming in the morning to pour that concrete. But boy, you you think of you know the cost to replace that pack should something go wrong. You always want to take steps to protect it. Right. Yeah, it's uh, if if you trusted yourself enough and were fast enough, you just start putting the pipe down as soon as the concrete truck is pulling up the driveway right. <laughs> but kind of a little right. but yeah yeah well and then from there you, you got a pressure test that i would imagine you know that's that's a, the next step yeah to take. so a couple a couple tips for that if you're going to uh, pressure test 
Uh, a lot of people use air only. Uh, and the reason that they would do that is they'll use compressed air because if it, you're in any sort of climate that it could freeze, uh, you don't want the water to freeze in your peck uh, right. before you pour the slab. You want to have antifreeze in that if there's any sort of potential uh, for it to freeze. So air is a good way to go if you don't know when the boiler is going to be installed and you know you've got a long lead time there. Uh, one of the things I recommend is just you don't need to you don't need to set any records with that. So usually PEX companies are going to give you a recommendation for the PSI you need, and it's probably going to be 120 PSI or less. I've heard some stories of people you know bumping it up to 400 PSI just to set oh. it or whatever. Uh, it's not helpful and it, it's dangerous as well. So if somebody dropped a hammer on a polymer fitting or something like that, uh, you could have a pretty rapid uh, amount of air coming out of a very small orifice, uh, which is very loud and very dangerous. <laughs> it's going to you know, fill up the, the advantages you'll know if you know, somebody else at the job site puts the nail through um, a piece of pipe that's under pressure. Uh, you definitely don't want that to happen, but you're going to uh, have a pretty big amount of dust in whatever room that was. Right, <laughs> all right. the air comes out of that whole field. So. Yeah. Do you ever have to worry but, about you know, using compressed air for for pressure testing, you know, with the temperature changes and the expansion, you know, I mean, PEX, when the temperature changes, I've seen it expand. I mean, it'll, yep. do you ever have and to run it in? It's a, uh, it can give you a false, uh, you know, false positive that you have a leak in some cases, if you install <laughs> the pipe and pressurize it when it was 40 degrees outside, and then you come back when it's, you know, 80 degrees the next day, um, um it's going to change shape a little bit. Sometimes, uh, in extreme cases, it can even bust out of a few fasteners and things like that. Um, it can so almost give you like a, an eye on. it can almost give you like a false impression of a leak too, isn't it? Because won't the pressure change as it expands? Yep. And um, one of the things that you know the PEX itself, if they're let's say you took the PEX to a thousand psi or something like that. Uh, usually the, the PEX is going to fail in what's called like a ductile mode. So it's just going to come out of the side of the PEX, but it doesn't like throw any debris or anything like that. But if you were to drop a, a hammer or a brick on a polymer elbow or something like that, that's when pieces of that chunks of that can fly everywhere. So some people will uh, do a pressure test with water or a mixture of air and water. You don't need as much air if it's mostly filled with water. Um, but again, the downside is that it can freeze. Um, right. Yeah. You want to know, you want to know what the weather is going to be so that you can protect that PAX. Yeah. Well, I think we covered the basics of PAX pretty well, uh, what it is and, and the types of PAX. Yeah. So we're going to pick this up on a part two episode. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, Max. Thanks, I mean, Max. I get to be a return guest. Yeah, right? we'll let, we're going to let you come back. <laughs> right. That's good. As always, thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you for tuning in. If you ever need help, please feel free to contact our tech support team anytime at techsupport.us at com, Or call us during our business hours at 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time at 414-238-2360.